But again, I just wanted to, to very clearly um, make it, make it uh, known to the people of Guam that this ethics process is done. It is concluded. After three years, um, thousands of pages of documents requested, uh, hundreds of hours committed, um, numerous dozens of interviews by a dozen investigators, and uh, hundreds of pages in, uh, in reports, uh, it has concluded with us not being found guilty of anything and not even being charged with anything. And with that, I'll go ahead and pause um, and uh, we can turn it over to our media partners for any clarifying questions uh, or to our legal team if they wanted to uh, elaborate further on what is a pretty perfunctory statement, but one that is very necessary. There's been no guilt found and no charges filed. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and pause um, and for Stan or Stanley or any of our media partners uh, to go ahead and avail and we can um, media partners indicate by raising your hand so our moderator Nelson Mori can uh, more fluidly manage the question order. Congressman, let me take that opportunity to clarify one point which I think is misunderstood um, by the public because of the legal implications and doctrines surrounding it, and that is the so-called referral to the Justice Department. Um, the, f the first uh, point to make about that is that it is not, in a sense, a formal referral because under House rules, referrals of any substantial evidence and we contest that the evidence is substantial by any light, um, has to be approved by the full House. That, that is a check and balance on a committee, as the checks and balances in Congress are exercised by the House over all committees. Um, just as you've seen in the recent January 6th committee hearings where contempt resolutions were referred, those were referred only after debate and approval by a majority of the House of Representatives. That did not happen in this case. Now let me address briefly, because again, this can, can foster some misunderstanding. The fact that a matter could be referred to the Justice Department does not presume that the Justice Department will do anything with that information. They may, in their discretion, conduct a preliminary inquiry, determine whether there's even enough credible evidence for them to begin an investigation. And that is a much higher threshold than what exists in the committee. The Justice Department is governed by rules of due process in the Constitution, which requires that before a case be brought, the prosecutors believe a good faith belief that they have sufficient evidence to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. And so this referral would never meet that standard uh, under any circumstance. And so no one should presume that because the committee has thrown down this gauntlet irregularly in my view, and without obeying their own internal rules, that there's any presumption of regularity with that referral. Uh, candidly, this was a way to charge Congressman San Nicholas without charging him, without giving him the opportunity to present his case in an adversary proceeding. So I just want to clarify that up front because I could imagine that people would have questions about the significance of that, of that terminology. Thank you, Stan. And, and I, I, I made an error in, in my introductory um, comments. Um, I, uh, Stan, Stanley Brand and Stanley Woodward are not just any run-of-the-mill attorneys. Um, these gentlemen are highly experienced in these kind of proceedings, and uh, that is why, um, with their counsel, um, the process has proceeded the way it has. Um, without uh, without putting you on the spot, Stan and Stanley, if you can just real quick for the uh, people of Guam, um, provide a very brief but uh, I guess effective um, uh, CV of sure. what your expertise is and, and why when you speak uh, with authority on these matters, um, they're to be regarded with all seriousness. Well, at the expense of aging myself, um, I began my legal career in 1976 when I became counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives under then uh, Speaker Thomas P. O'Neill. Um, I represented the House in complex litigations and constitutional cases for eight years, and then I left, and my, my tenure trailed me in the sense that I became, uh, you know, embroiled in a number of 
ethics and criminal investigations involving members of the House, some, some three or four dozen. Um, and at one point, even in 1984, I was hired as special counsel to the Ethics Committee itself uh, as the outside counsel in an investigation uh, involving a current member. So, so I have been at this in one form or another for uh, nigh on 50 years. Stanley, you're not 50 years old, are you? <laughs> I, I've been working with Stan now for about seven, seven years, I think. Uh, before founding our law firm in 2020, uh, Stan and I worked together at an international law firm, Aiken, Gum, Strauss, Howard, and Feld. They have offices in every hemisphere. Uh, the sun never set on their empire. Uh, and together we've worked on cases across the political spectrum. Um, and so when the congressman reached out about what... Um, about the allegations that have been levied against him, we were happy to roll up our sleeves and work with the ethics committee in an effort uh, to pursue the truth and to um, really get to the bottom of what was happening. You know, above all else, the congressman was very clear that the ethics committee serves an important purpose, one that, with that frankly, we agree with, and that is the discipline of members in the House. Um, it's, it's in the Constitution that all, the Ethics Committee, or really the House, and only the House, can discipline its own members. Um, and if that process becomes tainted, if that process becomes untrusted, then we, the people, lack or lose the ability to trust the, our Houses of Congress to discipline themselves. Um, and so for years, we worked with the Ethics Committee to provide them with all of the information that they requested so that they could better understand what was happening. Um, I, I won't pretend that we weren't disheartened that they levied this um, salacious report as against the congressman, but I think most importantly, um, they let us down, Stan and I, in that it was their responsibility if they felt so strongly about the conduct that they've um, described to bring any disciplinary action against the congressman. They didn't do that. Um, they did not bring any charges against him. Um, instead, they closed the case and um, were happy about that. That was the right decision. But it's very unusual for the committee to close a case like this and, and yet still to issue a report detailing allegations. We'll answer questions about them, but largely rehashed already by what had been publicly disclosed. Thank you, gentlemen, both. We do have several media partners with hands up. Uh, T, if you can uh, go ahead and moderate them, that way uh, I don't get in trouble from them for getting them mixed up in the order. Absolutely, sir. Thank you very much. The media question order in the order noted is as follows. Nestor Lacanto with the KUAM, you are now recognized. to unmute. Um, Congressman, um, so the, the alleged misconduct focuses specifically on one particular donation. So let me just ask you straight out up, up front, did you accept a $9,000 donation from a single constituent? No, I never I never received any donation uh, of the sort from any constituent. Um, but, but Nestor, to your point, and I think that that also just needs to be, to be um, uh, captured here, um, the report at, the, at, that, at this juncture, with, uh, again, no charges filed and no guilt being found, um, has narrowed down to only that single charge, and they've just completely um, ignored the remainder of the original charges um, that they claimed even at the time two years ago they had substantial evidence for. And so um, here we are now, um, and you're questioning me about that one particular um, item, and no, I never received a, a contribution from anybody of the sort like that. Uh, but... Um, and, and to my understanding, and, and our attorneys can clarify otherwise, I believe that um, through the course of the um, ethics proceedings, the ethics, the um, ethics investigators were also made plainly aware of that as well uh, on multiple on multiple occasions. Congressman, let me let me do jump in and clarify, um, Nestor. So the allegation is that that campaign contribution was provided, and the report makes clear that that donor. Um, told the committee that that, that that donation was provided. And in fact, that donor told
told the campaign that that donation was provided. And so out of an abundance of caution, um, we refunded that donation to the donor. That, that is what the uh, FEC requires. If a, if a donation like that had been made um, and had been known of by the committee, uh, by the campaign committee, that is, it needs to be refunded. So once the campaign committee was made aware that that donation had been made, it was immediately refunded. We don't know what happened or, or why the donor is saying that money was made, but just to make sure that we were in compliance with FEC laws and regulations, the uh, the amount of the money was refunded to the donor. So, so Stan, just to be clear, so, so it was, the donation was made then? Is that what you're saying? That's not what we're what, saying. Why that's not what we're saying. The, the donor says that he made that donation. Um, we, the, the congressman and, and the campaign, are unaware of that donation having been made. But rather than um, point fingers, we've made the decision to refund that donation so that we are compliant with FEC regulations. All right. All right. Um, so, um, and I'm paraphrasing here. Um, so that the ethics violation, according to the, the ethics committee, was kind of made moot by um, your stepping away, Congress from Congressman, from your congressional seat to run for governor. But they did say that you did not try and clear yourself, uh, but sought to evade. In, in essence, they're saying you were you were stonewalling them up until a point where um, you were going to uh, run for governor, and so that would render all those other. Um, allegations moot. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I can. I can respond to that um, on, on, on both on both fronts, um, Nestor. First of all, I'm still a member of Congress. Uh, I, I have not left my position. I do not intend to. Uh, me continuing to remain a member of Congress means that if the Ethics Committee really felt that there were um, there was um, sufficient evidence to actually file charges or determine guilt, they absolutely can. Um, and so the um, the assertion that I'm I'm seeking a candidacy for governor uh, is a reason for them to, to vacate the proceedings. That's that's not accurate. They they very much could have continued the proceedings, and it would have actually been more fair for them to do so uh, rather than to kind of um, short circuit the process the way they have, uh, push out the colorful report they did, uh, and the timeline that they have just two months before uh, my primary election. Um, so, so no, the um, candidacy for governor did not render this investigation moot. They, they very much could have proceeded with it. Um, and then to your second question, um, if you can repeat that, Nestor, what was the, um, the second inquiry that you had? Well, basically, um, um, why didn't you appear before the committee? Uh, you had ample opportunity and they had uh, repeated uh, invitations to you. Why didn't you try and clear yourself? Let me, let me jump in just a little bit for some preamble, Nestor, so that you understand. This investigation started on October 25th, 2019. From that day forward, we provided reams of documentary evidence. We produced bank records. We produced campaign records. And I believe there's correspondence in the file that suggests we asked them numerous times whether they needed anything else. We also uh, facilitated interviews with all of the campaign and office staff uh, to have them be questioned about all the allegations in the case. Um, we, uh, the la and the last thing that we did was to write a letter to them. We didn't know this was happening at the time on the very eve of their issuance of the report saying, we are ready, willing, and able to respond to a request for a deposition and show up and make whatever testimony we can or make whatever objections we have to the scope of the investigation in the committee. We never received a response to that, and instead they issued the report. And so I, I can't understand why they did that. I can only presume that the reason they did that is because they didn't really believe in their hearts that they had substantial evidence. They wanted to wrap the case up, and they thought the best way to do that was to issue this report with, without giving... Nestor, this would be like Jim Comey's press conference when he uh, cleared uh, Hillary Clinton and then said that she had been excessively secretive 
without giving her a chance to respond. The, the government has several options, and one is to bring a case with charges which allows the defendant a chance to respond to the allegations. They short-circuited that and never, never followed through on that process, so we never got a chance to fully respond, although we were willing to do so. All right, I'll, I'll defer uh, to the next. Ian Esther, next up in the question order, we have Devin Alicia with the Pacific News Center. Devin, you are now recognized. Up uh, today, everyone. I guess my first question would be to clarify something that was brought up by Nestor, and it's, oh, if, if, the, if the congressman denies that they procured $9,000, then how was it refunded, and why was it? Why why are you saying that it's refunded if, um, if it's been denied that the nine thousand dollars was uh, procured? Because in the in the campaign finance world and in the political world, when a cloud appears over a contribution, and the can neither the campaign nor the candidate can satisfy themselves that the the. Uh, con contribution is above, is above board, the very simple thing to do is to say, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, worry about whether it was or wasn't. I'm going to make a clean breast of it to assure the public that there's nothing wrong here and refund the contribution. And by the way, if you went down to the FEC and looked at the records there, you would find numerous examples of that over time where a question has been raised about a contribution and the and the genesis of it and in an abundance of caution and to meet the best effort standard that the FEC imposes the candidate or the campaign makes a refund and that settles it so despite our inability to to find, firmly establish whether that was actually made or not we remove the cloud by refunding the contribution which is what most campaigns and candidates will do. And if I could, if I could just jump in real quick, because you know, there's been there's been commentary, and I think um, the public has seen it, you know, from our opposition and, and their surrogates um, commenting, "Oh, you refunded the money, you're guilty." But again, the op the entire opposite is true. You know, when the when there was a question, even just a question of whether or not there was a contribution that was um, something that was not that was not supposed to be received. We did the right thing, and we returned the contribution. You know, the, the wrong thing to do would have been to, to retain the contribution and pretend that it never happened um, and, and still have that cloud, as Stanley mentioned, um, laboring over it. We said, no, you know, if there's going to be a question of this, we're going to do the right thing and return it, and we did. You know, so I, I don't know why there's a constant effort to spin um, doing the right thing into doing the wrong thing, but that's, that's been a, a basic tenet of this political season, and it's unfortunately been... Um, what what I've been having to go through for, for quite some time, and again, it's just it's just so gratifying to be able to to be at this at this juncture where obviously there's there's no sufficient evidence for anything any of that wrongdoing to be uh, in place for there to be any charges filed or any guilt out there. All right, thank you very much. For my next question, I wanted to ask. Well, according to the report, I mean, you and get it, it says here that. Um, Michael St. Nicholas engaged in extraordinary conduct enough to refer to the Department of Justice in what they call an instant matter. Now, whether or not um, whether or not these allegations are, were false or whether they were true or whether the report was colorful or whether the processes were, um, were, were misconstrued in any way, then th there, there was enough evidence to... Um, to make a report nonetheless. So on what grounds, I ask, could you say that these allegations are false? Well, uh, one, one, one ground, one ground, excuse me uh, for cutting in, but one ground would be if in fact there is substantial evidence, how do you justify not bringing the case? That That is the way uh, normal, legitimate law enforcement agencies vindicate their interests. On the, to, to say, on the one hand, there's substantial allegations, but we are not going to adjudicate them in the one body where they can be adjudicated, but instead pass them off to the Department of Justice um, belies the, both the substantiality of the evidence 
and their confidence that they could carry their burden of proof in an adjudicative proceeding. So to me, those are wholly inconsistent and contradictory statements by the committee. And I wanted to, I wanted to add two more points to that. I mean, first of all, they said that there was substantial evidence two years ago on a whole list of other items that they all of a sudden ignored in this final report. So for them to say there's substantial evidence in this final report on, that, on, on a singular item, uh, calls into question whether or not they have substantial evidence at all because they've been saying that and everything else and they haven't moved any of those other things either. Um, and, and, and then to a second point, and, and um, Stan or Stanley, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the evidentiary basis to, to levy charges, determine guilt in an ethics proceeding is lower, it's lower than a Department of Justice proceeding. So to, to not be able to levy charges or determine guilt at the ethics level, which has a much lower threshold, and to say they're going to refer it to a, the Department of Justice that has a higher threshold, um, it, it's, it, it, it's, like, it's like trying to um, have a, an entity that has an even, an even um, higher bar um, determine something that uh, an entity that had an even lower bar was, was unable to. And so, um, I mean, those are, those are just important points to take away from um, how the appearance of this and, and the actual um, and the factual uh, circumstances around it all are, are, are just not uh, consistent. And we wanted to make sure we clarify that for the committee. Okay, before I go, I wanted to ask two more questions if I'm allowed. Um, the, the committee reported that you have repeatedly sought, and this is just piggybacking off of Nestor, thank you, Nestor, repeatedly sought to evade and obstruct the review of this conduct. Um, now, that and with with um, with assumption that uh, that these things would go would go moot, like Nestor said. Now, were you aware that the statute of limitations for these allegations were going to be up, and were you um, were you running out the clock? Did you know that you were running out the clock? And I, let me address the statute of limitations question first, because that's a legal question. I don't know how they could conceivably say that given the House rule, which I happened to actually have a hand in writing when I was counsel to the House, which provides for a statute of limitations within the House of Representatives of three Congresses. That's six years. So what that entitles them to do is to bring a case for anything that would go back three Congresses, assuming a member of Congress had served in that period. So I, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, the, the statute of limitations within the House of Representatives is set out in the rules. And I'm unaware of that having run in, in any particular allegation that was at issue. And, and just to uh, you know, further elaborate, uh, and again reiterating the, the, the substantial evidence um, mantra, that's, they said that two years ago. They said that two years ago. How, how are we in any way running out the clock if they've had substantial evidence for two years and did not levy any charges or determine any guilt? Uh, so, so for them to, to now all of a sudden turn around and say, oh, you're running for governor, um, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to all of a sudden delay this. They've had three years, going on three years this October uh, to, to, to bring forward the, the quote unquote substantial evidence and to file charges of determining guilt. So there's, there, we, we, we played um, through the whole um, through the whole opera of this whole thing, and the conclusion is that the case is closed with no charges and no guilt determined. Devin, respectfully, I would put the question back to you. I mean, what what does the committee say we did to delay? You know, we can talk about the uh, the congressman's willingness to come in and, and give a deposition, but other than that. What, what explanation do they give for why this took so long? They, they don't give any because they don't have any. We, we have been cooperative throughout the investigation through two separate sessions of Congress. And now at the 11th hour, they claim that somehow we were delaying things. It's the, the evidence isn't there because it doesn't exist. Well, and they, we, would, we would respond at times to their documentary requests and their requests for testimony. And then we wouldn't hear back from them for months on end. In fact, I, I, I believe there were times when we had to call them and say, can you tell us when we can expect to resolve this? So 
I think that's a completely unsubstantiated claim by the committee. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, defer to the next um, reporter. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. We now recognize Joseph Titano with the News of the Daily News for his question. You are recognized. Uh, happy day, Congressman. Good morning or good evening. Not sure what time it is there. Um, why, why exactly um, was it that you didn't provide voluntary testimony? Uh, this is something that's noted through the report to the investigative subcommittee, the OC. Well, first and foremost, I think it's important that this is, I, this is a lesson I think that, that all of us, that all of us need to really take to heart. And that is that when you're going through an adjudicatory process, absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt on all circumstances exercise your rights your due process rights and so i have an excellent legal team who is advising us on multiple occasions um exactly how to do that and the reasons they've advised us to do that and do it in that fashion is because the um the sanctity of the outcome is is, is so um determined by the um ability to make sure the process is followed and is made whole and so on numerous occasions uh, my counsel has I've had to check the ethics committee and tell them, you guys, you need to follow your process because if we're going to have an honorable outcome here, it needs to follow the very rules with which this entire process is being established. And so I'll go ahead and pause there and allow um, counsel to establish um, exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, due process rights and then making sure that ours were, were being adhered to. Sure. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that the committee took the um, chose not to publish our correspondence with the committee about why, um, what rights we felt ought to be preserved. I mean, the, the congressman, like any other person who is the subject of an investigation by this committee or by any investigative body, is entitled to due process rights. Um, we respect those because um, we want to make sure that everyone who's being investigated is protected by those rights that are so enshrined in our Constitution. And so as we progress through the investigation, um, we asked the committee to ensure that those rights would be afforded the congressman. As, as we let, you know, again, unbeknownst to us, the investigation came to a close, um, but at the time we were, we thought we were negotiating good faith to make sure that those rights were being preserved. There's nothing wrong with asking um, that your due process rights be afforded when it comes time to an interview with the committee. Those rights include, for example, being represented by counsel. Uh, the very last offer that the committee made to us about having a sit down so that the congressman could explain his position, uh, the committee scheduled at a time when we were unavailable to provide him with representation. They proceeded anyway and said too bad. The congressman could either appear or not appear without his lawyer. That is not due process. That is forcing somebody to appear uh, without allowing them the rights to which they are afforded. Throughout our correspondence with the committee, you, will, you could see how we were simply advocating that the committee follows its own rules. Because if the rules are to mean anything, they're to be followed. And when the committee stops following one rule and then another and then another, how can we trust that they're going to follow the due process enshrined in the Constitution to which the congressman is owed? You can see other examples of us fighting on behalf of clients with the committee and with other committees of Congress and in, in making sure that the rules are followed. And you'll see that this is not uncommon. Um, I think probably most publicly, we did this on behalf of Dan Scavino with the January 6th Scavino, excuse me, with the January 6th committee, in which um, for months and months, we wrote letters back and forth with the congressional committee. Again, a referral to the Justice Department was made, um, and in that case, no, no case was brought. Um, so, again, to turn the question back, why did the committee not follow its own rules? That's the question that we have. In our last letter to the committee, we invited them to schedule a time when the congressman could sit down and tell his side of the story so that they would benefit from his perspective. We received no response. Um, I, I think 
more persuasively that Congressman has, has agreed to sit down before you today to answer any questions that you may have. Isn't that a, 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 a more forthcoming offer than sitting with a committee and allowing them to cherry pick his statements? What do you want to know? Here we are. Uh, well, well, the question I have, um, well, let's, let's start from here just to dig, drill down on that statement. I believe the last offer was uh, issued, the subpoena was issued on April 13th, um, and the committee did agree to reschedule it on the 19th um, to accommodate a request from the delegate that they appear in person. Um, Council, I believe, um, according to the document, on the eve of the rescheduled deposition, uh, you had raised several objections. Um, which ultimately uh, led to the delegate not appearing at the uh, deposition that he requested to be in person the following day um, after about 10 days. Uh, what's the explanation for that? Well, again, it's unfortunate that the committee did not publish the entirety of our correspondence and that they have chosen to cherry pick the back and forth that we've had. When Could we get a copy the... of that? Sorry? Could we get a copy of that correspondence and the objection? I... I'll defer, I'll defer to the congressman, but it's not protected by any uh, privilege. Um, so when the committee um, provided us with a subpoena for the congressman's testimony, we immediately responded and said that we looked forward to his deposition. And in fact, the congressman immediately made plans to travel from Guam to Washington, D.C. Um, the, the report does reflect that we also uh, requested that the interview occur in person. Um, because of our desire to present our testimony um, in the most forthcoming way possible. And the report does accurately reflect that the committee accommodated that request. Um, what it doesn't accurately reflect is that once they told us that they were setting a, a different date, um, we responded immediately to advise that we were scheduled to be in a, another court hearing. We couldn't be in two places at once. And so we expressed our concern that the congressman could not participate in a deposition in which his counsel was not also present. Um, now, the, the committee claims on the eve of a deposition, they received uh, objections to the deposition. Well, that's because the notice with which we were provided was short. And it didn't matter when we provided a response, it was going to be on the eve of the deposition. Um, now, what the committee doesn't explain or, or doesn't um, attempt to defend are the objections that we leverage. Uh, number one, the congressman is, is entitled to count, uh, representation by counsel. That is clear in the ethics rules. The rules say that he cannot be asked a question. They cannot ask him what his name is without his counsel being present. That's what the rules say. And so when we were scheduled to be in a federal district court at the same time that his deposition was set, something that was you know, public knowledge, um, it, it was impossible for the congressman to participate in that deposition. Second, we pointed out um, that the committee had not served the congressman with a subpoena for the deposition. Now, that is just a fundamental black letter law when it comes to serving subpoenas. You have to serve it. The email is not service. Mail is not service. You have to provide someone with a copy of the deposition. We're seeing that now with the January 6th committee again in the public. Why hasn't um, Mo Brooks been served with a subpoena? Because he's been traveling. He's been campaigning for um, governor. And Benny Thompson has said, well, we haven't served him with a subpoena, so he hasn't yet missed anything. They never served the subpoena. We complained about that. Um, we also pointed out that under the committee rules, under House precedent, and under... Um, decades-old case law that it's incumbent upon the committee to tell us what it is that they're going to ask us about. He is um, entitled to notice, which they also did not provide us with. So those are the objections that they say that, that we levied, and, and with the congressman's permission, we'd be happy to share our correspondence with the committee. Uh, if, if I could ask, um, you know, Congressman, throughout the process, you've been saying that you were cooperating with the committee, but it does note in the report that you had informed them um, through your lawyers that you were not going to be providing voluntary testimony. Um, why did you make the decision to address these allegations today in front of the media um, and not to respond voluntarily uh, in front of the committee? Well, that, I'll that, take that, that, that no. sure. as well. I mean, that's, that's, it's semantics, right? The committee, 
The committee is claiming that we were unwilling to provide information, and nothing could be farther from the truth. For three years, we provided them with every page they asked us for. And for us, for the committee to claim that, that, that there was some refusal to provide testimony simply couldn't be farther from the truth. They have subpoena power. If they want the congressman to sit for a deposition, they serve a subpoena, which they did, but they didn't do it properly. And all we ask is that they afford him with the due process to which he and every other member of Congress is owed. When we pointed that out to them, did they did they follow up and serve us with a subpoena so we would sit for a deposition so they could ask the questions that you all are asking now? They did not. In fact, they didn't respond at all and they simply issued a report. Uh, this is a quote from the report. Um, council had informed them that there are numerous examples of members who assert their legal right not to provide voluntary testimony, and they go on to state that they're not of any, aware of anyone in recent history who did that. Well, they don't cite any sources. And that their, their claim about this process is unsubstantiated. And so, you know, they are able to stand on a pedestal and issue this report um, they don't have to come before the press. Um, we are volunteering to come before you and submit to any questions. The fact of the matter is, is that the Ethics Committee and the way that it conducts itself is extremely confidential unless and until they issue a report as they've done here. And then uh, just, just to reiterate, we did even before the report was issued, which we were unaware of, even before the report was issued, despite all of this, we still wrote back to them and said, hey, look, we're still willing to sit down. When do you guys want to sit down? And they didn't respond at all. So, you know, that as much as the committee wants to assert that we, we weren't uh, um, interested in coming in and talking with them, not only were we interested, we wanted to do it face to face. We just wanted to make sure that our due process rights were being ironcladly adhered to because we want to make sure the outcome, no one's going to question the outcome based on any kind of due process um, shenanigans. So even on both on both sides, everything we wanted to be straight up. And so uh, when we followed up with them in this most recent letter uh, prior to the report being issued, saying, "Hey, we're still we're still interested," they they didn't respond and they didn't uh, they didn't they didn't take us up on that. And that's that's very important. There's another technicality here, which is a bit of getting into the weeds. But since you asked. There is also a rule which says that the committee cannot take any action within 60 days of an election. And so what I believe and surmise, I can't prove it, is that they knew they were running up against this blackout period and that they had to do something to uh, make their case before that time ran out. And what they came up with was this peremptory report which cut off the process and froze the record without us ever being able to make our defense. And so, uh, you know, that's a nuance uh, in terms of their uh, assertion that in recent history, um, that rule is a recent rule. And so I believe they rushed this because they knew they were running up against a period when they would not be able to charge us and give us a trial and do it uh, just uh, uh, Stan, what Stan isn't saying is and do it in order to impact the upcoming gubernatorial election you know they did this literally on the day before um, the blackout period was to take place uh, which is the, the most recent and the most uh, politically impactful time before this primary election and, and by the way, that rule was enacted years ago as a due process protection for members of the House so that they wouldn't be bludgeoned during a campaign with ethics allegations that remained in the air unresolved. That's actually supposed to have been a protection for the members' rights, which they conveniently figured out a way to evade by issuing the report. Uh, one last question. Congressman, what is your interpretation of what's unfolded? Why did these two witnesses come forward um, and make the allegations that they did, um, including that they were, uh, I don't think it's a stretch to say that they were intimidated uh, by a member of your staff. Um, why is this still on your congressional staff? Why is this happening? What is your understanding of this? I think that, um, I think that the um, character characterization and the um, detail in the report is uh, again, as as my counsel have stated, 
it's cherry picking individual statements and not providing the full context. Let me let me let me point something out to you guys. The OCE report that that was leaked and that's attached as the only exhibit on this IOC report. That um, that OCE report contains transcripts from those very same witnesses, or at least from from one of those witnesses that you're referring to. The ISC report does not contain the follow-up transcript. If you guys recall, one of the witnesses was called back to DC and was interviewed over again for a second time. That second interview, that transcript is not in the report. And, and we believe there's a very clear reason why. Because the testimony that was provided initially at the OCE level and the follow-up testimony that was conveniently not provided at the ISC level actually would have very clearly had contradictory statements that would have been very highly exculpatory and, 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 and very likely to have um, injured the credibility um, irreparably of the very of the, of the lone witness they're relying on uh, to claim there's some kind of substantial evidence. Why didn't the ISC include the second interview? Where is the second transcript? Why are they hiding the um, inconsistencies? Why are they purposely trying to um, uh, graph this, this narrative when it's, it's very clear that if you just put everything out there, we're able to uh, discern it for ourselves. Where is it? And, it's not there. and to, to emphasize that point, in the real world, in the, in the Justice Department world, not the Alice in Wonderland world of the committee, those transcripts would be discoverable by any defendant. In fact, not only would it be discoverable, the government would be obligated to turn them over if they contain any relevant or exculpatory evidence. Why, why didn't they print the evidence that they say they relied on if it was so substantial? All right, that's it for me. I'll defer to my colleagues. Thank you. Now recognizing Bill Leon Guerrero with the Guam Daily Post. Bill, you are recognized. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, I do want to uh, circle back to a couple uh, specific points in the report. But just a little bit ago, um, you you almost alluded to the, the fact that the timing of this report was uh, purposefully tied to your gubernatorial bid. Um, I'm wondering uh, why you would assert or allude to uh, this bipartisan uh, office, this bipartisan committee uh, having any kind of ax to grind in our local elections or, or would want to affect your political aspirations one way or another. It, it just seemed to that the, the accusation you were kind of alluding to was that this report and this investigation is a little more personal than just trying to suss out the facts. Well, I, I think, I think um, uh, the uh, the answer lies not necessarily in, in its relation locally, but it's re it's in re its relation congressionally. Now let's let, let's ex uh, examine that for a minute. The um, the ethics committee was asking us um, to take certain actions, like uh, come and sit down and be interviewed, even if it's against the rules that my attorney isn't present. You know, and we called them on that. We said, hey, you guys need to follow your own rules. You know, and so um, in, in in taking those actions and calling those things out. Um, the, the committee that, and I'm not, I'm not speaking necessarily towards the members, but more towards um, perhaps the investigators and the staff who are, who are making those errors, uh, they, they're not going to be too happy with that. You know, they're not going to be too happy with us um, making sure that our due process is being followed to the team. And so um, when you have an outcome like we've had, where there's ultimately no evidence and there's um, no charges being brought and no guilt being determined, uh, and, and a, a, a process that's not being followed and um, wanting to make sure that you're going to still be able to somehow um, send a message to the rest of the of the Congress, hey, you guys, you, whether whether we're following due process or not, when we want you to do something, you better just do it anyway, otherwise there's gonna be consequences. What's the best way to send a message that you better, even if it's violating your own due process, do what we tell you to do? What's the best way to send that message? Impact our elections impact our elections and make everybody else in the Congress be like, oh my gosh, whether they're violating my due process or not, I better just roll over and do what, what they're telling me to do. Otherwise, they might do what they did to Nicholas and drop all of this just before the blackout period, six, um, two months, 60 days before my election. So um, I, I really think that uh, 
Um, the timing, the timing is, is definitely uh, an issue. And I think it is an issue um, with respect to the upcoming election. Not necessarily that the committee has an interest in what's going to happen at a local election, but it absolutely would have an interest in uh, trying to send a message that, hey, you know, if you guys are, are, are too, um, are too dwarf right in asserting your own due process we have other ways that we can punish you for that and and that's that you know there's politics on guam which is we all know is very ugly there's also politics in dc and um you know it's 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 very easy for the uh the, the territorial guy to, to be the whipping boy and to and to try and, and, and use our strict due process as an, as an example but that's why it's so important for us to have a press conference like this and to clarify this information and to really explain what's going on because you cannot put out a colorful report like that uh, and say there's substantial evidence while you're refusing to actually um, include the evidence that you're referring to as an exhibit, while you're refusing to file any actual charges or determine any guilt based on that quote unquote substantial evidence. Uh, and when your own evidentiary threshold in your own committee is so low, you can't do any of that. And yet you're pretending that you're going to refer it to a higher threshold entity uh, on, those very, on that very weak basis. You know, so there's 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 a whole host of reasons why um, they they likely took the action that they did, um, but I would uh, I would I would um, speculate that you know there's 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 messages being sent uh, uh, by 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 the um, by the committee uh, basically indicating that hey look we're, there there will be electoral consequences if you don't do what, you, what we want you to do and that's very unfortunate you know and that's and that's one of the reasons why. Um, one of the things that we're going to be working on, uh, my attorneys and I, even though this is over, even though this is over, um, I'm, go I'm going to be drafting a letter to all members of Congress, to all members of Congress, of course, you know, thanking them for a wonderful working experience and letting them know that I'm going to be um, running for governor. But we're also going to include a, hey, guys, you guys need to take a look at this process, because what's happened here uh, for somebody who was not found guilty of anything and not charged of anything, what's happened here in terms of political consequences you know, and, and may I add also familial consequences and operational consequences. You know, all the strife and headache and heartache that all these allegations that turn out to be nothing have caused um, for, for my family, for our staff, for the people of Guam, you know, to, to all of a sudden turn it out like this, that, that's, just, that's just not right. And so while this is all over, we're, we're still going to, um, uh, you know, do our part to be positive contributors to the system uh, by, by um, penning letters to our, our fellow members and saying, guys, you're going to want to take another look at this because this is not right. Congressman, is there anything that was published in the report that you stipulate is true that you feel you need to either apologize or take accountability for? Um, I, I, really can't, I really can't think of anything right now. You know, if, if, what are you going to apologize for when you haven't been charged with any found guilty of anything? Okay, well, I, I, I also want to just maybe take some specifics from the report. Um, so, for instance, uh, you and your counsel in this press conference asserted that you never received uh, the, the cash donation that was above uh, federal limits for that election cycle. Uh, but the OCE report noted that it not just interviewed the uh, main witness, your former campaign manager, but another witness who remained anonymous that, quote, was able to corroborate uh, your campaign manager's allegations regarding the contribution, had firsthand knowledge of the events, confirmed that a cash contribution was made to you in September or October of 2018. Um, and I believe that the, uh, and that he was, a, they were aware of the contribution being discussed. So are, are you saying that both of those witnesses lied to the investigative subcommittee? We are, we are not in the business of trying to determine whether or not they're telling the truth. We're in the business of trying to make sure that um, everything that we're doing, everything that we're doing is above board, which is why that those funds were refunded. Whether or not they're lying was immaterial. We said, look, if, if there's something wrong there, uh, wrong or not, you know, uh, as, as Stan mentioned, if there's any kind of a cloud, we're gonna refund those monies. You know, and, and just to clarify, though, um, regardless of what the Ethics Committee has said to that matter, the, the Federal Election Commission, the actual agency responsible for policing uh, campaign finances, has not filed any kind of charges or levied any kind of penalties or consequences for us doing the right thing, which is conforming with the law 
to return funding that we believe was received erroneously. So uh, we, I can't see how we would be, uh, if you're inferring that we need to apologize for doing the right thing, I, I just can't see how that's, uh, that, that, that can, those two things can fit together. No, I, I, again, not inferring anything, not implying anything, just trying to, to get your perspective off of what was printed on the page. So um, the report also noted that you dispatched a staffer of yours from DC to Guam to have a discussion with the donor, where I believe in his interview that wasn't attached to the report, but was alluded to essentially uh, to have a conversation that he did not give you cash. Why was a why was a DC based dispatcher dispatched to have that conversation? Why couldn't it have been someone from Guam or on Guam at the I, time? I really I really can't speak to that because we again as as Stan mentioned we have not been afforded any of those transcripts so we don't know the the full detail uh, of the conversation. Uh, but, but I will say this. Uh, you know, the outcome and the conversation all all came together. The the, the fund the funds were returned. You know, so I'm, I'm not quite sure where they're 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 trying to insinuate that there was some kind of um, conversation trying to manipulate an outcome when the actual outcome was uh, was was exactly what we did, returning the funds. You know, so so the insinuation in the report that there was somehow an effort to 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 manipulate the the. Uh, whether or not a donation happened or not was, is, is completely the opposite. You know, the funding, the funds were actually returned to the, uh, um, uh, they, they were returned to the donor. And sending a pre-written message to the donor for him to sign wasn't an attempt to manipulate the donor to stipulate to certain facts that you were asserting? The, um, the uh, I, I think what you're referring to is the uh, communication um, from the campaign manager to, to verify whether or not there may have been a, do a donation or not. And so- uh, the, I'm referring to, uh, in what the report refers to as staffer A, sending a communication to the donor, uh, among other things, requesting that he sign his name to a letter um, that was sent to him along with her communication that stipulates to certain facts that he ended up not stipulating to. I, I, I wanted to, to see, because the committee uh, asserts that that's part of the evidence that you tried to conceal or cover up the illicit donation, whether sending that pre-written message was an attempt to manipulate or somehow otherwise influence the donor. I, I can speak to what we've seen previously, which uh, again, we, we haven't received any kind of transcripts from any of those witnesses, but I can speak to what we received previously in the OCE report. And in the OCE report, um, there was a communication that basically said um, we did not receive any funding. You know, can you can you confirm that? I I, I personally did not receive any funding. Uh, can you confirm that? And uh, the response was uh, was was to the affirmative. They they they, they reworded it, but they said the exact same thing. You know that uh, that that they do they do believe a donation was made and it, and it wasn't to me. So there was how can we try to manipulate an outcome when the responses were materially the same? Okay, um, I, I don't want to take up too much more uh, time for my colleagues. I know that there's at least one reporter uh, that hasn't had even a, a chance to, to give a first round of questions. So um, I, I guess for, for this last part, and hopefully a first round, um, I, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, your running mate, uh, Sabrina salas Matanani, if you had a conversation with her since the report came out, um, if her absence from this conference it has to do with anything other than scheduling issues uh, does she have your support I, I just wanted to understand uh, how, how we should uh, how the relationship has been since the report released um, let's go ahead and move on to the um, to the next media question and let me see if we can um, facilitate a response to that uh, in the course of this press conference bill we'll, we'll try and get back to doing that thank you congressman thank you thank you Bill now recognizing last but definitely not least, Johnny Rosario with the Candid News Group for the first round of questions. Hey, Congressman. Uh, this is Danielle Baza. Um, so I just wanted to ask, is it true that the individual that is making the allegations is the same one that received the, the donation in question? I, I, I cannot necessarily confirm that because I, I wasn't party to, to him receiving anything. 
Uh, but uh, I, 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 you know, I'm not sure. Okay, so, and the second interview is not available to you either. Yeah, no, they, they, uh, again, and this, is, this is just what's so disturbing about the process, as Stan mentioned, in, 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 a, normal, in a normal setting, right, the, the, uh, the prosecution would afford the defense uh, discovery of, of any evidence that may be exculpatory. Uh, for them to, you know, and, and it, was, it was, you know, you guys covered it in the media, it, it, was, it was made into a big deal, you know, he's summoned back, he's going to go back and say something. Where's the transcript? You know, where is it? Why? Why all of a sudden is this something that's not that's not being released? You know, if if, if that is um, a key component of this quote unquote substantial evidence, then where is the transcript? You know, and, and again, I would speculate that that transcript actually, uh, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure that transcript just has so many inconsistencies uh, with the initial testimony because uh, the initial testimony was was grossly inaccurate, uh, and we knew that we knew that um, when we saw it on the OCE report. Uh, and so when there was this uh, recall uh, for, for new testimony to be provided, and that testimony's transcript is not in the report, um, why wouldn't you put it there if it said everything that you wanted it to say? You know, so yeah, we haven't seen it, um, and it's not there. Thank you, Congressman. Also, are you still pushing forward in running for governor? Um, I you? wanted to do, um, conclude the, um, fir first conclude the um, media round of questionings before we address the um, um, uh, our our electoral uh, process going forward. So, but, but thank you for that. We will be addressing that um, after we finish going through the questions from uh, our media partnership. Thank you, Congressman. Do we have any any follow up questions from any of our media partners? Yes, hi, Congressman. This is, this is Nestor. Um, so I just want to go back to the timeline again, because that seems to be what's the most damning information that has come out from the, the Ethics Committee. Um, and it's replete with um, allegations of, and, and then I'm not comparing it to Watergate, but, you know, in, in, in a lot of cases involving Congress, it's the cover-ups that are the more egregious offenses. And so the timeline contains um, a number of instances where I think Phil was the one who referred to it as staffers that were approaching the donor. Um, and I think the quote was, this never happened, quote unquote. Um, and, and, and you're saying earlier that you returned the funds. Uh, do you believe that by returning the funds, that kind of absolves you all these other um, allegations that were contained in the, the timeline? Because, um, you know, I think there's a lot of skeptics out there who who are taking the ethics committee by its its word or its, its written word that, you know, these what these witnesses are saying are true and that they saw fit to publish it in a report and then refer other um, well, allegations to the Justice Department. Let, so let th me, they're, um, they're, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me suggest, Nestor. This is not a process to be taken at the word of anyone. This is a process based on evidence and proof and documented facts. So I would suggest you shouldn't take them at their word because their word isn't backed up with the evidence they say they have that furnishes the basis for their conclusions. That is not our judicial, happily, uh, even in Watergate, uh, that is not our judicial process. Our judicial process is based on facts, evidence, weighing of testimony, credibility of witnesses, uh, persuasiveness of the evidence, probity of the witnesses. That's what it's based on happily in our system. And they haven't come forward with that. So I, I don't take them at their word because their word is not backed up with what the legal system requires them to provide. Right, right, Council, and I, I understand that, but um, we are, uh, in, in speaking for our media, we're, we're basing what we're asking of the Congressman on uh, a report by a bipartisan Congressional Ethics Committee. Uh, and so these are all things that um, came out in their report, which was released a couple of days ago. And so, um, that's what we're basing our uh, our questions on, not necessarily um, the uh, witnesses themselves, but what the yeah. um, 
ethics committee compiled from the witnesses. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I'm suggesting that's an incomplete, and you shouldn't rely on it um, for the reasons we've articulated over the last period of time. Um, if the committee says that the moon is made of green cheese and can't produce evidence to substantiate that, I don't know why they're believable any more than any other investigative body or, or committee would be. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm being a bit of a defense lawyer to, to, to you know, to pardon the, the role, but this is really the core of the system, which, by the way, the Congress is supposed to adhere to. This is a quasi-adjudicative process. That's what the courts have called it. And so when you issue a report and you don't provide the, the baseline evidence that forms the basis, I don't know why it should have credibility just because it's stamped by the, by the committee. That, that isn't the way it works. Yeah, and I, I guess this is all going to come down to credibility. Uh, that, that's the, the key word here, the credibility of the congressman versus the credibility of the ethics committee and the report they just read. Let me just ask it, um, the congressman. Um, so one of the things that the, uh, um, the committee wrote was that your actions brought discredit upon the House, and I suppose by extension discredit to the people of Guam. How would you respond to that statement? Again, um, I think that that's a, a, it's a very unfortunate thing for the committee to do. It's a, it's a very unfortunate thing for the committee to say uh, when they didn't give us an opportunity uh, to be able to actually present uh, the evidence that we have, the evidence that we have to um, very clearly um, illustrate that uh, this, this whole thing should not have turned out this way. You know, and then for them to make a statement like that, I think um, is, is uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a way for the committee to, to illustrate political consequence um, if, uh, to any future members uh, who may assert their due process rights. You know, we're, that report, <laughs> that report without any evidence, uh, without any transcripts being provided, being as colorful as it is, and saying those kind of things is, is, um, is definitely drafted in a way to create as much political damage as possible without having to own it without having to own it with any charges or any determination of guilt. And, 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 and even more egregiously, without even having to own it by providing the very transcripts and evidence that they keep referring to. You know, so so those kind of statements should not have been made. It's, I, I find it to be very unfortunate. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take our lumps as, as we have with this process. It's, it's, you know, it's obviously not been a pleasant one, but um, that's they, they chose to, to say those things, and that's, that, that is their, their decision, but we know better. All right, thank you, Congressman. You piqued my interest when you said you're going to talk next about um, your gubernatorial campaign, so I'm anxious to hear about that. So I don't have any other questions on the uh, Ethics Committee's uh, report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I'm glad that you're very interested in our gubernatorial campaigns. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from any of our media partners? Uh, yes, thank you, Congressman. So I, again, just want to revisit maybe the statute of limitations and how your lack of involvement or lack of cooperation with the committee was viewed on their end and on your end. I'll try to keep it brief because I also want to uh, move on to, to election matters as well. Um, but uh, while your counsel alluded that uh, Congress could go back some years uh, to, to complete its investigation even after you leave in Congress, the report notes that pursuant to the United States Federal Code, a five-year statute of limitations, quote, for the potential criminal conduct at issue, end quote, which uh, is what leads to their uh, a statute of limitations they expire next year for some and 2024 for others. So uh, given that they have described your lack of cooperation as delay tactics, uh, not uh, showing up for your voluntary deposition on December 4, 2019, not uh, appearing for your subpoena that was issued on April 13th. Um, wanted to give you or your counsel, again, just one more opportunity to explain uh, if this report is one-sided, uh, how their viewpoint differs from yours on, because essentially they're saying these delay tactics and your lack of involvement essentially forced them to the only viable alternative, which was to forward this to the Justice Department before they couldn't prosecute you if they find if they so desire. So again, I know I know that you covered it, but I, with all of that in mind, I, I wanted to, to understand where you and your counsel are coming from. 
recall legally their reference to a criminal statute in a congressional investigation is a complete non sequitur because that statute of limitations doesn't apply to the committee. They have a separate statute of limitations. If what they are saying is all they were doing was trying to set the congressman up for a criminal prosecution, again, without following any of their rules or providing a defense to a set of charges, then they're admitting uh, that they're doing someone else's job and they're not really interested in finding out the truth and coming to a conclusion. So I suggest to you that the statute of limitations issue is a complete red herring. And if they wanted to pursue this, they would have. They've thrown all this chum in the water to try to body the congressman without giving him a chance to respond. The statute of limitations is a non-issue because they have their own statute of limitations that allows them to pursue whatever they want. If they're just a stalking horse, for the Department of Justice, then that undermines their whole constitutional basis for doing anything. And, and, and if I could, if I could further clarify, Phil, because I think the question is, you know, were we, were we, quote unquote, as the committee claims, stalling this in order to, to lapse some kind of Department of Justice statute limitations? The, the, the Department of Justice uh, does not wait for a referral from Congress to act. If there is something there that they believe needs to be acted on, and if there is a concern based on a statute of limitations basis, the Justice Department could have interjected at any time. As a matter of fact, as my counsels can affirm, there were other cases in Congress that were being handled by the Ethics Committee where the Justice Department did interject. So for the Ethics Committee to somehow, you know, again, um, very colorfully make it seem like this referral was necessary in order for the Justice Department to, to take it up is absolutely false. Um, the Justice Department could have done that at any time. And so for them to further insinuate that they're rushing this now because we're trying to make sure that the Justice Department statute limitations, that they have enough time, that the Justice Department does not wait for a referral from Congress to act. And furthermore, even if they're, they're, they did refer this, which my counsel uh, uh, elaborated further, um, is, is still questionable because of the requirement for it to be uh, proper by the full house, even if they did refer it, the Justice Department does not just take the work of the Ethics Committee and jump off from there. They initiate their own process and proceedings from day one. So this this, this quote-unquote referral to the Justice Department isn't speeding anything up and isn't um, giving the, the, uh, the Department of Justice a, uh, a head start, so to speak, to try and beat some statute of limitations. They need to set their own, um, their own process and go through all of their own steps because it's an entirely separate agency and, and an entirely different threshold. So, so yeah, I, I, you know, them, them saying that and them, and them alluding to, to that being the reason is, is, as Dan said, it's a non sequitur and it was, it's just completely uh, for the purposes of coloring that one of the report. Uh, last question for me on this topic. Uh, there, there have been investigations that, for lack of a better word, have gone away following the resignation of members of Congress. Has any member of Congress, any member of their staff, or anyone approached you with some sort of deal that if you were to have resigned your seat before your term uh, expired, that uh, there would be some sort of favorable outcome for you? Well, first to answer the question, no, but I, I think that, that you do raise a, a point, Phil. If we wanted to avoid this, we could have resigned. You know, we're still here. We're going to be here all the way up until the end of the term. Uh, and, and, and here we are with the outcome of no guilt being established, no charges being levied. You know, so I don't, uh, no one approaches of any deal. And despite, you know, again, um, uh, our political opposition and their surrogates um, constantly making a, uh, putting it out there, oh, he's going to resign, oh, he's going to leave and run away. We're here. And the outcome is there's no guilt and there's no charges. And we're still here. So, yeah, we didn't resign and, and, and we don't have any intention. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask more questions on the election topic, but I appreciate the second round. Sure, no problem. Is there any other um, questions uh, from our media partners? One last sure, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, if I could, um, just to circle back to that um, 
uh, that that a, that cash amount that was refunded. Um, I guess the question is, how, how exactly do you account for um, is that ten thousand dollar amount, um, and why do the dates October five and September fifth um, match up with some of the dates on uh, WhatsApp messages between the campaign donor and your former campaign manager um, that were time stamped and that he was able to produce, um, and also with um, you know text messages that I believe were pulled from uh, your home phone between yourself and the campaign donor that are that are involved in that report. I guess what, what, if, they, if, they, if it wasn't an illicit cash donation, um, why does it match up with those two other points um, that, you know, there was communication between the two other witnesses in the case, um, that you were, um, at least from your own phone, uh, with the donor at that night, um, and why is that the date, why are those the dates that are reported on the final refund? I, I'd like to, at per, first, in front of my counsel, I did not see any um, exhibits illustrating any text messages between myself and and any campaign donors, uh, gentlemen, did, was there anything there uh, that was that was as, as the reporter mentioned? There, there are text yeah, messages. I may be misunderstanding. Talk about um, the the fact that that one person claimed to be a campaign donor was having communications with you, but as you pointed out throughout this process, um, names are withheld. Um, Exhibits are redacted. Um, it's difficult for us to ascertain what exactly um, was told to the committee. What I think we can all agree on, um, based on what the report divulges, is that there is a donor um, who claims to have made a contribution to the campaign through the campaign's then um, manager. Um, we don't know what happened next, but when we learned about the fact that that donation was made, we, among other things, consulted with the FEC as well as um, with our campaign staff to ascertain what steps need to be taken. The clear guidance from the FEC was that if a donation, in fact, of that nature had been made, then it needs to be refunded. Um, it doesn't matter that we don't know what happened to that money. Um, the, the law requires that it be refunded. So the campaign um, made a payment to that donor um, in order to make um, him whole and to reverse any um, donation that, that, had been, that had been made. That's reflected in the public um, FEC filings that the campaign corrected in 2019 after all of this came to light. There's, there's no question about that. Um, so it's hard for us to defend ourselves in response to specific excerpts that the committee has provided because we don't have all the information that identifies the people or persons that are speaking. Um, what we do know is that immediately upon learning about the alleged donation, we refunded the money because that's what the law requires. And the FEC has taken no further action. I think, I think specific to the question, I think the question was the timing of what was alleged and, and, and certain events that were held during during the months of September and October. Um, that was, I'm sorry, that was from Devin, yeah? Devin, the, the primary is in end of August. The general is in November. Of course we're going to have events in September and October. You know, so uh, the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the fact that we had events in September, October, and the, and the fact that there are allegations during during that period, of course, there's going to be events in September and October. So um, I don't quite see how there's even any kind of um, basis for us to be able to say that uh, events in September and October and, and allegations during the same time period can have any kind of material connection. When when else are we going to have a campaign uh, a campaign fundraising event if not in September and October uh, for the general election after a primary election in August and a general election in November? September and October, the only two months we're going to campaign, fund. we're going to have uh, uh, fundraising activities. I, I guess, Congressman, and I, I, there's also an additional um, one thing found in the report. I believe it's a seven thousand some dollar donation that's made um, at the end of October. Um, the report does state that there wasn't a fundraiser um, held during that month. This is back in 2018. Um, I guess, how do you account for that? Our camp I think I think I think it needs to be pretty clear that campaigns 
um, especially during election season, uh, and especially in the months preceding the actual election, uh, we're raising funds on a regular basis. You know, we're not just raising funds when there's an actual fundraising event. We have people making contributions on a regular basis. And whenever contributions come in, whether there was an actual fundraiser or not, we got to report those contributions. Now, is it possible that there may have been some unfair accounting that, uh, you know, even maybe you might have been aware of uh, during the time? I'm not speaking to any of that because that, that didn't occur uh, on my, uh, with my action or on my behalf. But, you know, so anything's possible. Anything's possible, yeah. But, um, you know, again, the, uh, the, the um, timing and the, um, the illusion that somehow uh, whatever, whatever is being alleged occurred and, uh, and, and, uh, and us having uh, fundraising activities or fundraising um, uh, ongoing is, is, uh, is moot because, of course, we're going to be fundraising in September, October. You know? and, 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 and I think that, that um, you know, all of these, all of these um, facts are, are just further basis for the reason why we haven't been charged or found guilty of anything. You know, I mean, look at all of this stuff. Where's the evidence for any of that? Congressman, way back at the beginning of this, one last question. Um, you had said that this was a, a retaliation for, um, I believe there were some FBI complaints that you had forwarded um, regarding local government officials. Um, is it your assessment that this is some kind of a conspiracy or a operation to discredit you? I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not looking to, to, to blow anything into any new stratosphere. Uh, I, I really, and, and as we as we stated earlier uh, at the onset, wanted to clarify for the people of Guam uh, that um, the um, the reports that we were found guilty are actually inaccurate. We were found not guilty. Uh, we weren't found guilty of anything, and we and we haven't had any charges filed against us. And and we wanted to, to, to clarify that. That for me is is. After after all of this, and after all the heartache that's that, that, that's transpired, and um, and and um, the, uh, the politics that has 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 gripped our community over a nine thousand dollar nine thousand uh, dollar allegation uh, that was that was returned anyway, regardless of whether it was uh, 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 you know, ascertained or not that, that it was received, uh, it's still returned anyway because it was the right thing to do. Nine thousand dollars, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, we're, we're just. You know, we, we don't need to blow anything into the strategy. We're just so glad that the outcome actually uh, is exonerative in the in the sense that there's no guilt established and there's no charges filed. I'm only bringing it up because that was what you had said uh, when the investigation kicked off three years ago with the political retaliation related to that. Uh, but uh, that's not, nothing else for me, uh, but my colleagues. I have one last question, um, Congressman St. Nicholas. This is Devin. That was Joseph. Uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, it's okay. So my last, I only have one question, and it sounds like you guys, um, from what I understand, you and your counsel were ready to give testimony. Is that true? We have. It's a, we have it documented all the way up until three days prior to the report. Now it's documented on multiple occasions. Right. So counsel, I'm. As I understand from what you said, the committee had two to three years to make a report that provided substantial evidence that you say, in the end, is rushed in an attempt to, in um, Attorney Stanley's words, bloody the congressman. Um, and you say that you gave ample documentation and chances to provide willing testimony to the committee. Now, whether, they, whether or not they responded back with the time and place, guilty or not guilty, why didn't MSM... Well, why didn't um, Michael Senecalus, the Congressman Senecalus, and his legal counsel show up to the metaphorical door of the committee and say, I'm here to provide testimony? Why was there still a, a back and forth and a waiting for it? We actually did do that. Right, Stan? We did that on yeah, that's the last correspondence we had with them. We wrote them a letter and said, you know, we want to be clear, the Congressman invites a deposition. Tell us when and where to do that. Let's let's find a mutually convenient time to do this. Here are the concerns about the way that you all have conducted this process. And we concluded the letter with, tell us, call, give us a call. Let us know when we can come in for our deposition. And we received no response to that correspondence. Instead, the committee issued its report in which it purports to describe us as having been obstreperous. I, I will note that for three years, not quite three years at this time, but for two and a half years, the committee had been conducting its investigation. The period of time where they're describing us as having 
been sticklers for the rules for due process for, for constitutional rights that was that was just a couple of months and so it's unclear why they blame us for dragging this out when they couldn't complete it in the 116th congress and they barely completed it in the 117th congress they've had all the time in the world to do this they waited until the 11th hour to schedule a deposition we educated them on what the rules for doing that required and then they balked and said never mind we don't need to know what the congressman has to say we'll just issue a report all right thank you very much that that ends my question do we have any other questions from any of our media partners well if none um uh, th thank you all very much for uh, for affording us the, the, this opportunity in this round. I know that we definitely do want to get into the um, the uh, the next phase of things, which is the um, the gubernatorial uh, the upcoming gubernatorial election. Um, my my running mate. There was a question about my running mate and, and her sentiments. Um, she is of course uh, uh, watching us at three. It's uh, it's uh, it's ten thirty p.m. over here, so I'm sure that you're uh, a lot more bright-eyed and bushy-tailed than, than we are. Uh, but but she has provided us with a, a, a short video recording uh, of her sentiments, and uh, at this time we'll go ahead and um, see if you can go ahead and, and, and play that for uh, um, the uh, benefit of the listening audience of our media partners uh, and and, uh, and for Sabrina. Thank you, everybody. I just wanted to come on here because I know a lot of you are wondering how I feel about the news that broke over the weekend. But first, I just want to thank all of you that checked on me to make sure that I'm doing okay. I just recently returned from an alcohol trip. From the moment that I decided to run the Congress of Mexico Nicholas, I knew that it was not going to be easy. I knew that it was going to be controversial. I lost longtime friends and I thought it was family, all because my business was located in Costa Rica. Public officials and media colleagues that I once respected came after me, criticized me for being out on their experience, some even claimed that I do this out of some family politics. All of this was despicable. But I also made many new friends that welcomed me into their homes, greeted me on the streets, grocery stores, gas stations, and yes, even when I didn't have coffee with them. Like myself, they want change. They want to end the dirty politics of the past, where the more money you swipe, the more personal attacks and character assassinations, the better. This has to stop, and it will. The day that I picked up a package with Mike, the media asked me about my thoughts about the ethics investigation. And I responded that I would cross that bridge when I get to it. Believe me, we are truth. I'm sure many of you may have heard the rumors that I plan on walking away from the campaign, or even yet, that I plan on taking some sort of deal to work with the opposition. Of course, I was concerned about the ethics report, but my feelings have not changed about why I decided to run. What has changed is that I'm so glad that after three long years, this investigation is over and is concluded with no charges against the congressman. When you read the report, it is the same allegations we've all been talking about over the past several years, and I would know because he was in my job and I was not bad. Although this has been referred to the U.S. Department of Justice, it does not mean the equivalency of anything. But over the next few weeks, our opponents will capitalize on this report. They will continue their campaign of cyberbullying and vindictiveness. They will attack my credibility and my integrity. They will do what they do best, attack, shame, vilify, buy votes, and pulpit-billow our government's finances. I am not a quitter. I signed up to fight for the people of Guam. I signed up to lead with Congressman Michael St. Nicholas, and I will not give up. To our supporters, do not be distracted. Let them come after us. Let them say whatever they want. We are willing to take the punches. Because as I said before, the risk is worth it. You are worth it. Please, if you have not done so, register to vote. And vote. Take a stand against the negative politics. Stop the fear and retaliation, retribution, 
all of it. Say no more. You know, I, uh, when I, when, when I, when I came to Oak Reef and, and, and with her background and, and her um, experience and expertise, uh, we, we were so honored and, and, and it was, it was just, uh, it was such a blessing. But to have somebody, to have somebody who has the same passion and commitment and willingness to go through whatever it is that we got to go through, whatever it is that we got to go through for the people of Guam, in order to bring a better island and in order to to truly make things improve for our people, to have a partner who's willing to go through anything to make that a reality, willing to go through anything the way we have to make that a reality, is is, is, is such an incredible blessing. And so, Bri, I wanted to just thank you for uh, thank you for taking the time to, to 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 put that together. And I wanted to reassure the people of Guam. I wanted to reassure the people of Guam that we are not going to be um, scared off, or we're not going to back off, or we're not going to be intimidated off. Um, trolls can come and say what they may, and uh, everything can, can can look bad or as bad as, as they want to try and make it look. We've been going through that for years. We've been going through that since day one. Everybody's saying that we're not doing anything or where were you, while well, we've actually been delivering the results regularly and for you, the people of Guam. And that's what this this candidacy is all about. You know, we're not running from anything or resigning from anything. We're staying right here. We're getting outcomes even after three long years. You know, we're willing to go through whatever it takes. We're willing to go through whatever it takes for you. And so we're two months out from this primary election. And we're not allowing ourselves to be deterred. We're not allowing ourselves to be discouraged. You know, and we're asking you to join us and stand with us. And let's truly build a responsible Guam. Let's make real change happen, Guam. You know, let's do this together. And, and, and Bree, thank you so much. I want to thank my family. I want to thank my, my, my team. I want to thank um, my, my, my amazing counsels who are just, they're, they're gentlemen of the highest order. Uh, but most especially, I want to thank um, the people of Guam. We, we've, we've gone through everything together. Let's make this island better together. Thank you so much for, for that opportunity. Um, to, to just say a few words to our media partners and uh, I'll go ahead and pause if there's any uh, questions that you may have about our gubernatorial candidacy but I think our response is clear. We're not going anywhere. The People's Day will come and it's coming August 27th and we're looking forward to that election day. Congressman, can I ask real quick, um, when are you going to be back on island again? It, it, you kind of alluded to the fact that you were in D.C. or at least somewhere on the East Coast. We, we will be back shortly. Um, we are um, having some uh, items out here to tie up. Um, there are some uh, congressional um, uh, business that we're moving forward. The NGA is um, um, finalizing amendments into its package. Uh, and then we're also um, working on um, securing the, uh, the necessary logistics for our uh, congressional replaying ceremony for our annual Liberation Day, uh, which we're finally going to be able to do um, at the Arlington National Cemetery after um, a two year hiatus due to COVID. Uh, so we're tightening up some DC items. I, it's 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 an extraordinary challenge um, wearing this congressional hat and and having to uh, to literally be in two different time zones and, and in two different parts of the world uh, almost on a 24-hour basis. Uh, but yeah, we're still out here, Phil. Uh, we'll, we'll be out here for a little bit longer uh, until we tighten these items up, and then we'll, we'll be back home. Uh, given that this has been referred to the Justice Department, and there are some people that are wondering you know if another shoe drops before between now and when the report expresses statute of limitations are concerns about what happens if an arrest or charges are filed after the primary after perhaps you win uh, the election and become governor um, what would you say to voters that may be a little bit warier or their vote could be impacted by what they wonder could be a worst case scenario if this progresses and triggers some sort of uh, crisis of governance, uh, crisis, the constitutional or organic crisis, the, whatever the local equivalent could be, if a sitting governor uh, is arrested or charged by federal authorities? Well, I think that that question needs to be posed to our current sitting governor. You know, I think media partners were forgetting that she's been referred by our own public uh, public auditor. This administration has been referred by our own Guam public auditor to the attorney general for the questionable procurement practices 
um, of, of the, of the um, COVID hotels. You know, and that's, and that's just one of many examples that our people of Guam are aware of um, that, are, that are actionable, not only on a locally legal basis, but perhaps even on a federal basis, especially because we're talking about ARP federal money here. You know, and so I, 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 I would pose those same questions to everybody else still, you know, but at least on our circumstance, we've cleared the ethics process of no charges filed and no guilt being ascertained on a lower threshold. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not at all concerned about any of the shoe dropping on our end, but, but folks, let's not forget about all the shoes that are still in the air of this current administration. You know, and, and, and why, why is it that, that we're constantly um, trying to find a potential uh, thing to worry about, even after we've been found um, with no charges and no guilt established in this circumstance, we, we are the only ticket. We are the only ticket that's actually gone through an adjudic adjudicatory process with no charges and no guilt. This governor still has a whole lot of really questionable things out there, and those shoes are very much in the air. Those shoes obviously have been dropped for political purposes, and I would I would even proffer that's perhaps the biggest reason why they're scared of a Nicholas Salas Massinati ticket. You know, they're out fundraising us 10 to 1. They've raised maybe over $500,000, and we've barely spent $23,000 on this campaign. You know, we're, we're out here with uh, with a little cotton candy machine and and, uh, and our folks in, in, in unicorn costumes, and we're, we're, we're bringing smiles and joy to people of Guam. And it's so terrifying that we have attack websites and troll surrogates and, you know, all these different things that are being thrown at us on a political basis. And, and you really got to step back and ask why. And Phil, maybe it's because when we get into office, you're, you're really going to see which shoes are dropping. And it's certainly not a $9,000 shoe. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars of dropping shoes. So let's let's definitely put things into perspective and contextualize them. Um, I am not concerned about that. The people of Guam shouldn't be. And if that's something that, that should be on people's minds, let's not forget where we really have serious questions. And believe you me, when we and I get into office, people of Guam, we're going to get all those answers for you. Thank you, Congressman. Hi, Congressman, it's Nestor. Um, so what what gives you optimism um, to um, uh, continue your campaign? Um, have you done some internal polling that shows your, where you're at? Um, could you give us some insight into what, um, what uh, gives you this optimism? Well, having a running mate is definitely something to be very optimistic about. Um, having the family support, the team support that we have is definitely something to be optimistic about. But what we're most optimistic about, Nestor, is the, the fact that the people of Guam, you know, the people of Guam want good things to happen on our island. And the people of Guam, despite every effort to try and make it seem like somehow the last four years in Congress had nothing to do with me, they know, they know that when we get into office and we say we're going to deliver something better, that we're going to do everything that we can to do it. And so we definitely are not optimistic because you know, we're, we're, we're raising a, a ton of money. We're definitely not optimistic because we're bringing out huge crowds. We're optimistic because we know that the people of Guam want an island that's going to finally serve them, serve all of them. Something that's going to put many legacy issues uh, to rest. Something that's going to truly see our health, education, and public safety systems uh, improve. And, and, and the headlines change. The headlines that Bree's been reporting on for the last 25 years finally change so we're not talking about the same problems uh, not only in our in our media and in our news stories, uh, but even in our political debates. You know, let's move Guam forward. And, and we're, uh, our optimism, our confidence comes from the fact that we believe we're going to do that. And we believe the people of Guam believe that too. And that's all we need. We just need to believe in that. And we just need the people of Guam to believe in that also and have them come out and vote on election day. That's, that's a whole lot to be optimistic. So what specific issue do you think is going to resonate the most with uh, voters and uh, are, how, how will you address it? The, I think that the most specific issue is the, is the fact that our island has so many issues, Nestor. It has so many issues and, and it's so many of the same issues. And, and all of that, all of that uh, can, can be lumped into, into one single reality. And that is that the politics on Guam has not resulted in the real change that our people are looking for. You know, the same way that the politics for decades in the Congress did not deliver the results that our people were expecting, we can get in there. And despite all this, despite all this extraneous stuff 
we stay focused, we work hard, we deliver the outcomes and results for the people of Oman congressionally, and the people see that, and they know that, and they believe in that. So the biggest issue isn't, isn't, um, isn't any one thing that we can point out, it's the so many things that our people all know about, and the fact that we're going to be able to go in there and finally deliver on remedying those things. So I, I, I think that, um, I think that to, to try and narrow it down to anything singular, uh, would be a disservice to, to the, the bigger picture. And I think the people of Guam all, all agree that the bigger picture is, is a whole bunch of things that we need to work on and that they can trust that we're going to be the ones to deliver on. Well, let me suggest one issue that I think would, would probably top most uh, people's minds, and that's the pocketbook issue, uh, particularly in a recession uh, that we're facing um, and when our prices are skyrocketing for food and oil. Um, everything else seems to take second place to this. You know, we have abortion, we have, um, you know, the Ukraine conflict. Um, let, let's say pocketbook issues are the top concern. Um, putting food on the table and the roof over their head is the main concern uh, of, of the people of Guam. How would you address that? Pocketbook issues, pocketbook issues have multiple uh, variables. We're talking about the cost of housing. We're talking about the cost of power and water utilities. We're talking about the gas prices that are through the roof. We're talking about the cost of food and, and how that price has just gone through the roof as well. And, and all those different uh, topics have different um, uh, areas that, that would require us to act in and, and provide solutions. Uh, I, I, I would, I'm gonna totally take the opportunity to answer this issue. I'm gonna go into detail over it. I hope I don't take up too much time. But for housing, it's a supply problem. We need to increase the, the availability of labor. We, we open the door for that with our um, NDAA amendment to allow for H2B workers to come in um, and, uh, and address one uh, local housing needs. But we need to take it a step further. We need to incentivize affordable housing um, workforce development. You know, so instead of having, for example, like a manpower development um, uh, charge for bringing in an H2 worker, uh, create a manpower development incentive if you're bringing in that H2 worker to build affordable housing. We need to incentivize contractors to start building houses for less than $150 a square foot. You know, once we begin powering up those incentives by incentivizing the labor coming in, by creating tax breaks specifically for um, the, the um, construction materials for affordable housing, we can bring down the cost per square foot because then the, the tax basis is going to be addressed and the labor basis is going to be, is going to be flush. Once you begin enhancing inventory, prices start coming down in housing. It starts coming down in the cost of new, new units, existing units, and rental units. And so um, creating um, a manpower development incentive and creating a tax incentive for affordable housing will, will help to do all of that. And that's, those are things that we're absolutely going to want to address. Um, for our cost of utilities, one of the major things that we need to, 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 point, to pinpoint is the LIAP. You know, the, the, basically the cost of, of uh, the liquid fuel that's powering our generators. And right now, you know, as, as we know, you know, when the price of oil fluctuates, um, eventually the, the, the LIAC fluctuates on our utility bills. And anybody who looks at their utility bill will see that a huge chunk of the entire bill is actually the price of, of the underlying fuel cost. What we need to do, and, I'm, and I've actually been in communication with the um, um, Chicago, Chicago Futures Trading Commission uh, and the Options um, uh, Trading Commission, is we need to begin smartly using our LIAC to be, to be hedging our liquid fuel prices. You know, instead of just being at the mercy of oil flying up to $140 a barrel or all the way down to $20 a barrel, you know, when we have these um, these fluctuations and when LIAC um, uh, ebbs and flows, let's take the savings in the LIAC and hedge the price of the underlying fuel cost so that when it goes back up, we're, we're, we're hedged and we're not having to pass that increased cost to our consumers. And that's the way that we can lower our utility bills per item. Uh, when it comes to gas prices, I made a, a, a very um, in-depth um, piece, uh, a, a video and a research, uh, Senator Clinton Legel um, kind of jumped on board with that, and that is that we, should, we seriously need to, to look at the, um, the excessive prof profiting of our, of our gas companies. You know, as we illustrated in that video piece, the standard margin for liquid fuel uh, in the industry is about 20 to 30 percent, and yet our liquid fuel companies, based on the information that we received from an insider, was margining up to over 60 percent. You know, and so that that's without federal excise taxes, guys. Now, let, let, let's let's remember that Guam liquid fuel companies do not pay federal excise tax. And so recently, you know, there was a a, a, a rollback of the liquid fuel tax, a couple of cents, and yeah, that's going to provide some kind of a relief. But if the 
absence of a federal excise tax already is not being realized and huge margins are being made, then ultimately we're going to see even the savings of the liquid fuel tax reduction evaporate and those margins continue to climb. We need to seriously go in there and see whether or not the, um, the capping of, of profits to a more reasonable rate of 30, 20 to 30 percent of these liquid fuel companies is something that we're going to be able to muster legislative support on. Let's do it. Let's do it. There's no sacred cows. When our people can't afford to drive to go buy food <laughs> and they got to choose whether they're going to buy the food anyway because it costs so much to get there or, <clears throat> or when they're putting off medical appointments because they can't drive to the doctor, you know, <clears throat> that all bets are off. Let, let, let's take a look at, at what we can do to make sure there's still a fair profit environment, but one that's livable for the community that's relying on those liquid fuel prices. All right, Congressman, th thank you very much. I I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunity to yeah. ask more questions. I'm only going to be next year, but okay. All right. Okay. Thank, Anybody thank else you. have any questions? Let's have a question. Uh, Devin Alicchio from the Pacific News Center. Um, I wanted to ask, I wasn't there for your filing, so I may have missed out on this story, but I wanted to ask, um, who reached out to who in terms of running for this election? Like, um, how did this team come about? Oh man, I was I was uh, so fortunate to to um, to ask Sabrina if she if she uh, if she was so honored to be to be my running mate, and, and she said yes. Yeah, and, and here we are. And um, I wanted to ask, and I, I don't mean to wrap on the competence of. Sabrina Salas Matsunani on a political level, but why Sabrina Salas Matsunani? And why not somebody from, um, um, let's say, the legislature? Well, I, I, I don't know about you, but did you just hear her video? You know, her heart is absolutely in the right place. Her, her willingness to go through anything. And that's what you just can't find. You know, that's what you just can't find is the people, a, a person who's willing to go through anything, anything to make sure we do good things for the people of Guam. She even alluded to, to people trying to call her to, to have her uh, walk away after all of this or, 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 to, or to make her an offer or make her a deal to, to give her some kind of a parachute. And she's staying put, guys. She's staying put. So this is somebody who not only has a heart uh, for, for, for this kind of a service, but a willingness to make this be what it's all about. It's not about how we can or how she can, can, can try and get something else out of this. This is about the people of Guam, and she's going to be um, committing herself entirely for that. And that's, that, that's something that, that I think is priceless. But on top of that, you guys are in the media business. You guys see the stories every single day. Bree's lived up 25 years. She's seen the same headlines over and over and over again. She's seen the same kind of political talk that, that gets on and, and says, you know, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and it doesn't happen. And Bree has signed up to do this with me because that's not the future that we're going to write. And that's not the future that we're going to want you guys to report on. So I'm so honored to have Bree running with me. And if anybody is going to allude to the fact that she doesn't have any kind of political experience, I say thank goodness, because political experience has put us exactly where we are right now. And I want to run with somebody who's going to get us out of this mess that's been a long time coming. Uh, thank you for that. I, I wanted to ask just one more question. I'm going to piggyback off of a colleague. Um, the Guam Daily Post had a poll, and the question was, um, how do you feel about this upcoming election in regard to uh, Michael St. Nicholas and the uh, investigation that's going on? 80% of the people that were polled say that um, you should just resign. Now, what do you have to say to that? And are you still uh, striving forward with confidence that this election is, can be yours? This election isn't going to be mine. It's not going to be Breeze. It's going to be the people of Guam's. And so we're going to plow forward regardless of what any poll says. And the people of Guam are going to have their day and they're going to have their say. Thank you very much, thank you very much. That, that's all my questions. Thank you. Are there any other questions from any of our media partners? If not, I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank Stan and Stanley. It is 10.50 p.m. on the East Coast. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making yourselves available so late in the evening. Um, are there any parting words from the two of you before I bid you farewell? No, we appreciate the opportunity to try to explain the legal landscape to people. Um, it does have some complexities, and so thank you for letting us uh, try to do that. Stan, thank you, Stanley, so much. Gentlemen, you guys have a great evening and, and, and a, restful, a restful sleep. <laughs> thank you.
Thank you. And, and, and just in conclusion, you know, I'd just like to, uh, again, um, and speak directly to the people of Guam. Uh, we, we, will, we will do whatever it takes and go through whatever we have to for you. Uh, Sabrina and I, whatever it takes, we will stand in the breach, we will take the blows, we will take the neg negativity, but we will also deliver the outcomes. We will also deliver the outcomes. So this election is in your hands. You know, this election is in your hands regardless of, of what's being put out there and regardless of what's being shown. What you do in that voting booth is yours and yours alone. So if you want to make sure that we change course for this island, do good things and put people into office who are going to fight for you no matter what and take on anything, no matter how long it takes until we, we finally get the outcome like we've had of this this case here and, and, and these uh, these these, uh, these realities. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just something that we're always going to be willing to do for you if you will so have us. So thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you and thank you so much for the opportunity to, to, to speak with you um, this evening, your morning. And, and most especially, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to just be considered by you in this upcoming election. It is the honor of a lifetime. Thank you, T, so much for moderating. Thank you to our media partners for participating. Adios, good night, and it's Jules Mahasi. Recording stopped.